Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm saxophonist and vocalist Camille Thurman, and this is The Haven Hang. This is our second session, and I'm really excited to have some guests with me today. Um, it's, I just was so happy putting it together because at first I wasn't even going to do this session today because of what was happening all over the country, but some friends of mine encouraged me to go forward with it and to do it, and we're going to be speaking on the arts and how artists can use that in creating a social active or social um, conscious work and give back to the community. So today, I am really happy to be joined by four incredible artists in different disciplines, and I'm gonna introduce them to you right now. Okay, the first artist is a journalist, a DJ, and she is a film producer. She is a writer and such an incredible person. And I had the privilege of meeting her through one of my best friends, Uni Mojica. Her name is Angelica Beener. Angelica Beener is an award-winning journalist with a dynamic career in the music business spanning 20 years. And she has contributed to work to, at uh, the Huffington Post, NPR, Jazz at Lincoln Center, John Beat, and Downbeat Online and National Public Radio. And her main focus is using social activism and finding a way to create pieces that get people to think about social justice, the culture of jazz and how it intersects with race and gender and various generations. She's a recipient of awards from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting as well as the New York Association of Black Journalists and she is a fierce advocate for gender and racial equality, particularly in the arts. Please give a warm, 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 warm welcome to Angelica Beener. Welcome, Angelica. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Camille. Of course. The next person I'd love to introduce you to you today is vocalist, composer, and mixed media collage artist and activist, Melanie Schultz. Melanie Schultz is a South African-born, award-winning jazz singer and composer. Playing piano since the age of five, she went to study classical singing at the Eon Group before completing opera with a cum laude honors at the University of Cape Town in 2000. Melanie has released five albums under her own name thus far, as well as collaborating with many South African and international jazz artists. I had the fortune of meeting Melanie this past year with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra because we did the music of South Africa in 25 years of independence. And she's just an incredible artist, a great human being. And she's a fierce mixed media collage artist, which this piece right here, she actually did and gave to me. So please give it up for Melanie Schultz. Welcome, Melanie. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, Camille. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. The next artist I'm really happy to have here as well is choreographer, dancer, installation artist, activist, mother, warrior, and educator, Nia Love. Nia Love's art is committed to expanding and destabilizing conversations of intersectionality, transnationalism, blackness, and tools of embodied memory. Loves continue, loves continue to explore the power of feminism, the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, critical construction through racial theory, gesture, and semi semiotics as, well, as a way of expanding her own personhood and cultural acuity. Love teaches, performs, and guest lectures at some of the most distinguished art and educational institutions and festivals throughout the state and abroad, including the American Dance Festival, Fordham and Ailey, BFA, Bard, Queens College, University of Illinois at Urbana, Champlain, the New School, UCLA World Art and Cultures, Texas Women University, Princeton, Hunter College, NYU, and so many other institutions. She is an amazing person. I'm fortunate to have her as my mentor. Please welcome Nia Love. Welcome. Thank you, Camille. So glad to be here. Happy to have you. And the final artist that I'm super happy to have 
is a Grammy nominated vocalist, composer, arranger, producer, theatrical performer, and teacher. Lene Marie. In the span of two decades, 11 recordings and countless stage performances, vocalist Renee Marie has cemented her reputation as not only a singer, but also a composer, arranger, theatrical performer, and teacher. Guided and tempered by powerful life lessons and rooted in jazz traditions laid down by Ella Fitzgerald, Dinah Washington, and other leading ladies of past generations, she borrows various elements of folk, R&B, and even classical music and country to create a captivating hybrid style. Her body of work is musical, but it's more than just music. It's an exploration of the bright and dark corners of the human experience and an affirmation of the power of the human spirit. Renee Marie tastes admit mainly influences and she's got a penchant for original songwriting, especially where social justice intersects with personal biography. Issues she sings and gives voice to are homelessness, mental illness, racial and social injustice, as well as paying homage to legendary heroes and activists like Eartha Kitt. I <laughs> love and admire and respect Renee for her strength and her take control of your life and give back to the community spirit. Her music has a spirit of freedom, awareness, and forward moving truth that's always refreshing and it feeds the soul. Please give it up for Renee Marie. Thank you guys. Welcome. Thank you, Camille. I'm honored to be here, be a part of this. Okay, so the reason why I gathered everybody here today is because I wanted to use this platform as a chance to connect with young artists, particularly young women artists, and kind of create a virtual mentorship. And because of what's happening today with George Floyd, and of course, what's been happening for many, many years with the Black Lives Matter movement, I wanted to speak to the four of y'all and have you share information on what inspires you to create your art and how do you connect it with what's happening with the community and, and using it as a way of activism. So, I'd like for Melanie to go first. <laughs> okay, sure, wow. We're diving straight in, Camille. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm really super thrilled uh, to be asked to be part of this very esteemed panel. And um, I really i am such a great fan of so many of you here. And of course, Camille, who I had the privilege of just working with now with the South African Songbook for the yeah. past six, eight months. Um, I would like to say, just even touching on um, my role in, in, in that beautiful production, it came about from a passion project uh, with um, esteemed poet laureate, Dr. James Matthews in South Africa. And uh, James Matthews is uh, currently 91 years old. He's a dissident poet. Uh, I was introduced to his poetry through my father, who's an English teacher. And uh, his works were actually banned in South Africa uh, in 1974, Black Voices Shout and uh, the anthology Cry Rage, um, from, from which Freedom's Child is a part of it. Um, and as part of, you know, my journey, um, somehow uh, James's words kept kind of intersecting in my life. And then at the time when I really wanted to do something different and, and write music to someone else's words, uh, somehow James's poetry found me once more and the album Freedom's Child was born where I took 11 of his poems and, and wrote music to it. Um, and just as a passion project, that was something that, you know, I feel so enriched and so full of life. And, and I feel like I could really die tomorrow because if I didn't release anything else, I feel like I would have kind of paid respect to, to Brad James um, and, and to just people who came before him, to all the giants that were not just artists, but also activists. So this was very inspiring for me. James's, um, the, the, the um, anthology Freedom's Child obviously informed my album Freedom's Child and became a movie to which the soundtrack actually was a kind of biography, you know, biopic of his made by acclaimed um, award-winning uh, filmmaker, uh, Shelley Barry, who I've just had the privilege of, of working with over the past 10 years. Uh, Shelley's an award-winning um, filmmaker, and uh, she's also worked um, closely with the Sarki Bartman Center for Women and Children, for which one of my songs was also used as part of the documentary. 
uh, I'll speak a bit about, about Sarki Bartman Center. I don't know how many of you know Sarki Bartman and her story. So she was a, a, a Khoi, a Hottentot woman, and Khoi and Hottentot and, and San are our indigenous people in South Africa, much like the Native American Indians here or the, the Laplanders, the Sami people from, from Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Finland. Um, and so Sarki Bartman, unfortunately, was taken by the French um, and exploited, you know, um, made to be part of kind of a freak show, a circus. And uh, when Nelson Mandela became the president, you know, her, her lineage, her line, her bloodline called for her to be brought back home mm -hmm. and buried in a dignified manner, which of course happened thanks to Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a center in the Cape Flats erected in her honor uh, as a haven for abused women and children and women who are, you know, just needing a space that feels non-threatened and, and you know, easy to access where, where their um, abusers can't find them. And most importantly, where their kids can also have refuge together with them. So Shelley was involved in something called the Digital Diaries. And um, this was really teaching these victims, instead of writing down something, to use a camcorder and film how they felt every single day, their whole process of healing. And then she taught them how to edit all of this. And this became a beautiful documentary film called Beyond the Shadow, um, which was amazing to, to witness. Shelley invited me. I got to sit in the audience and, and just see all of this evolve. There were also actually men present at that gathering, which I thought was so important because it really wasn't a demonizing of the perpetrator or the abuser, but saying, why don't we rehabilitate our men in a way that they can see what they're doing is incorrect and heal them at the same time, healing their wives or their girlfriends and their, and their children. So this was really very cathartic and really beautiful to be part of. And as I said, one of my pieces, A New Day, was part of this credit role. Um, I also wanted to speak of my work with Artscape. I, I mentioned this to, to Camille when I spoke with her. And I was once again, was very privileged to work with a team of just amazing women. Marlene LaRue being one of them. Uh, um, Tanya van Zitters, uh, unfortunately she's passed away last year, which is a big loss in our community as artistic women. Marlene LaRue um, went on after the audience development and education department, which she ran when I was still living in South Africa, went on now to become the first black CEO of Artscape. Um, Marlene's been very instrumental in, you know, not just making art for art's sake, not just involving women who she knows are amazing at their craft, but also in educating audiences, um, and especially audiences who, who aren't able to um, come to theaters easily. So, so for instance, uh, you know, she'd, she'd you know, get the buses to bring people in from different parts of the Western Cape and Eastern Cape to enjoy theater that was being geared to um, speaking about the social consciousness that was happening in South Africa at the time. Um, and I was lucky to be part of a Women's Month festival in South Africa. August is a Women's Month, and the 9th of August is National Women's Day. Um, and, and sadly enough, you know, studies have shown the past year and a half that during Women's Month, that's when the most um, heinous crimes are actually inflicted upon women in South Africa. So this for me is so tragic that we we have this month to celebrate everything that is beautiful and feminine and divine. And yet this is the month where we are having the most trouble with rape and with abuse. Um, and so, you know, this was happening in 2012 that I was part of this amazing collective. The, the part of the program that I produced was called The Eve. And of course, a play on the words, The Eve, the, you know, the, 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 the time before things happen. And of course, first woman, The Eve. And um, I was joined, you know, together with another beautiful dance production called I Stand Corrected. And this was, um, was done by Mamela Nyamza, um, South African award-winning choreographer and British writer, Nigerian um, Moisola Adebayo. And you can, you can find more 
on I Stand Corrected um, at Straight Times, and that's S-T-R-A-I-T-T-I-M-E-S dot com. If you want to read up more about what that production was about, I'll touch very briefly on the fact that it, it, it went about corrective rape. And at the time, there was, you know, a big, big brouhaha, as there should be then and now, about women being correctively raped. Um, they are seen as, we're going to rape you until you are the way a woman is supposed to be. You know, this, this level of that you cannot be yourself, that we are still not being accepted in, in all of who we are. Yes? Um, curing lesbians. This is what they were saying. Curing lesbians. Um, I, was, I was reading up uh, on an article actually published in 2014. Um, and it was by the independent newspaper. So if you just type in independent newspaper corrective rape, you'll find an article really covering all of that by Patrick Strudwick. Um, and I remember at the time that when we, when we did this work, it was received so beautifully, not just by, by, by women, but also by men, because we cannot put all men into the box of being abusers and perpetrators. Um, it's, it's very important that we understand that. And also, um, the way things are in South Africa, I feel that we have a lot of tribalism to contend with. And at the time, our president was Zulu, meaning that he had a number of wives, which is completely allowed within that, um, that tribe. But it did set a different kind of precedent for the rest of the country to, to have to follow. Um, and I remember there were, there were so many people who were, so many lesbians who were correctively raped in that time that were, were brutally murdered and attacked just by being who they are. And somehow the communities, you know, were not standing up for them the way they should have. The mothers and the grannies and the aunties, of course, the women were standing together. But, you know, we still have a problem that tribally, we still believe that women are supposed to be a certain way, that they're supposed to, you know, be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen and they can't have careers and they can't, they can't be gay. And, you know, I, I, was, I was really struck by how powerful it was what we all put together in terms of music and dance and art, because there was some artwork that was exhibited as well, you know, a lot of different um, photographers um, came together and, you know, took pictures of all the different grandmothers and all these different rural communities. And that was part of an exhibit that happened, you know, simultaneously with everything that we were putting on on stage. Um, but yes, art in going with um, Camille's theme, my message to a lot of the younger, you know, female musicians, artists, no matter what your genre is, we do have that, that amazing soapbox to stand on and, and just say how we feel, you know, without judgment or without direct criticism, we have that platform. And it's such an important platform because otherwise we're just making art for art's sake. What are we saying? Why are we here? Why were we given these amazing gifts? Um, you know, why did we answer the vocation? Because I do believe that art, you know, like teaching, like becoming a priest or a nun is a, is a legitimate vocation. And, and when you do answer that call, you know, you kind of do a pledge to, to say, well, I'm going to do the best that I can with my God-given abilities to, to shine light on things that, you know, often swept under the carpet. And, and so I really, I've been very fortunate to see the direct impact that art, artists, and especially females standing together can, can create. And um, yeah, I've just been incredibly blessed to, to have had the opportunity. And I hope that more opportunities like that will, will come forward. Thank you, Melanie. You're welcome. Mia? I know you do some incredible work with choreography and you have a wonderful prog project called GI Host. Could you share about your work and uh, how it ties with the community and activism? Yeah, sure. There's so many things that you said, Melanie, that I want to comment on. <laughs> and I wasn't taking notes, so I might forget them now that I'm refocused. But so many things I think about the way that you were working in South Africa. I too was working, uh, I, I, working period, you know. Um, I think in all the multiplicity 
of ways that I work as a choreographer, as a, as a researcher, as a mother, um, as, a, as, as um, a redefiner, if you will, of um, domesticity and that relationship, right, to the power of identified female energies, right? Um, that live deeply inside of uh, African spirituality. Um, um, so this particular work that I've been working on, I guess the last seven years as both a, a choreographer, director, and now an underwater film, um, a filmmaker. Um, uh, this particular piece is called G1 Host. Um, and the G1, just uh, the, the title is an interesting intersection that grapples with um, the word ghost. Um, it's a serial multimedia performance uh, and a site of study. Um, it kind of marks this continuous engagement on memory and prolonged histories and the afterlives of the transatlantic slavery. Um, this unfolding kind of term of ghost uh, works to pursue these questions regarding my body status um, with historical, geographical, and atmospheric limits. Um, and it pivots on a fundamental query of what remains after the middle passage as force, gesture, and effect. Um, so that doesn't necessarily respond immediately to the body, but also responds to notions of uh, the way the body is situated in physical spaces. Um, um, so this kind of um, elaboration on this study was partnered with an amazing, uh, now dear friend of mine, uh, for the last five years, we have nurtured our relationship. Um, an amazing professor and scholar, Christina Sharp, uh, who wrote In the Wake on Blackness and Being. Um, and she actually gave me this language, if you will, of how to recapitulate uh, myself um, in my body, literally and figuratively in the wake of transatlantic post-slavery. Um, and I decided that I would go uh, get my deep sea diving license uh, two years ago because some of the um, regards of what was supposed, like a 600 year, if you will, scavenger hunt <laughs> uh, that I couldn't even begin to imagine unless I went under the water, right? So unless I communed with forces uh, beyond gravity, uh, forces of density, um, forces of the ways in which oxygen and sodium ignite and partner, um, what's left behind. Um, now, much of the work is um, a really deep investigation of what Kamau um, Brathwaite uh, describes as a geopsychic disaster. Um, the notion that um, uh, geology and, and the ways in which our landscape has shifted throughout Pangaea, before Pangaea, right, has everything to do with kind of disaster, a natural disaster. And that energy of sorts that ties deeply inside the movement forces of our planet, right, uh, have much information, right, to give us. Um, I think as artists, um, we're really, um, it would behoove us to you know, I mean, we are revolutionaries. Um, we see beyond uh, what most people are able to see, maybe perhaps because, you know, we hold on to the notion of our, of our little spirit self, if you will, the imagination, right? And so 
in the notion of this image space, it lives as a real nation in our body, in our recollection of memory, as Toni Morrison says when she talks about the notion of, of um, re-memory, right? And how that, um, how that informs our every, our every wake of our body cellularly, um, as well as um, shifting notions of time, right? And replacing ourselves back into a, into a space. Um, and she has this quote about a house burning down uh, in Beloved, um, and she talks about this house burning down, like, and even though the house is burned down, like all the memory about what happened in that house, every, every aspect of the furniture, everything that took place in that house is still there in space, floating somewhere, right? And so it, it just doesn't dissipate. Although we may think that um, with the loss of a, of a home or the loss of a person, the notions of what is losing, right, then gets, um, hopefully for artists, we, we can kind of take that ride and surf through the recapitulation of how that plays itself out in this nation of image space. Um, so, so this work is a seven-year-old work. Um, um, I said I was partnering, and I am still partnering <clears throat> with um, Christina Sharp, as well as Sadia Hartman, who talks about um, ways in which Black life has been skewed, uh, the calculus and the arithmetic of disaster of Black bodies for centuries. Um, she puts name to, understanding to, um, um, and I and I and I'm I'm really excited to be working with her um, as well as I kind of get through her book for the last five years. I've been trying to work through that book for five years, y'all. I'm telling you, just the forward is enough to take you a year because of all the references that she really um, um, inlays inside of of the work, and that's um, um, the way that that she works, you know, um, that scenes, um, what is it, uh, scenes of subjection, right? So I'll write, I'll write some of these things down because I told Camille, maybe it might be really good for us to write some of the things down for y'all because I'm, I'm involved in my shit and, you know, as all of us are. But I, in my hopes as an artist, right, as a movement maker or builder, um, I feel like, I can reach people uh, in a way that, um, uh, because I love to touch, you know, I love to, not that everybody loves to touch, but the notion of reaching beyond my own physical body is the notion of placing myself also in partnership with another body in space. And there's something about that partnership that's so human and so like beyond these words uh, it, it acts as a, as a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of alchemy, if you will. Um, so I'm hoping that this work that I'm doing um, will allow people to, to heal, uh, allow me, first, I would just say it will allow me to heal through some very serious trauma. Um, now I'm thinking about this work that was really very external, kind of not not completely external, but it was really historical and geographical in its context as I made it and as I as I keep to keep on um, researching it. I decided that one of the things that made me do it was when my father passed away 21 years ago and he asked that his body be cremated and his ashes be spread at the Gulf of Mexico. So I was like, yo, what the fuck? Like the Gulf of Mexico, daddy, what, what, what was that about? I didn't, I didn't understand that. And it took 15 years to come to an epiphany after much study and much relocation about the ways in which I think. Um, and this, this, this work, G1 Host, really allowed me, it, it's called G1 Host, colon, Lost at Sea. And the Lost at Sea is all like discombobulated in one word. 
so it's it's hard to make out. But I, I feel like that along the time of his death or his transition, that I was discombobulated with a lot of things, a lot of ways in which I thought about life, a lot, a lot of ways in which I thought about death, uh, partnership, love, um, scrutiny, trauma, whatever. So um, anyway, um, I think that this now is a love story. Um, it always is a love story, really. But I had identified, I had never identified uh, post-slavery from another context from underneath it as a love story for us, a love story that reunites in a way that's so unimaginable, deep underneath, that's so geographical, that's so geological, that's so, uh, it's a multiplicity, a serial investigation on the ways in which we live on this planet and atmospherically, right? So I'm also thinking about the water uh, cycle and the relationship of what that energy is from all those bodies that were either pushed off, jumped off, fell off of those boats or those ships along the transatlantic journeys, right? That hit that water in the wake of that catastrophe and that energy igniting aspects of that water from shoreline to shoreline, from, from, from country to country, from Brazil to South Africa, from South Africa to uh, Tanzania, right? And so these kinds of like inlays of the ways in which we see each other uh, is something that I'm interested in really deep diving deeper into. Um, so yeah, um, I guess that's uh, my work at this moment. <laughs> Oh, you don't have your mic on. <laughs> Thank you, Nia. You said something about using the art to be able to touch and to reach people and to connect through these experiences. Renee, I was checking out your music and you had a song particularly called This Is Not Another Protest Song. And I con connected with that so much because you were sharing the experience of somebody who dealt with mental illness. And for me, I have family that had the same struggle and the way you interpreted and sung the song it was as if you were speaking to people to understand what it's like for a person that's dealing with the struggle almost like advocacy for people who for, for people to understand what it's like to deal with that can you talk about that and also share what you're doing with your your work and how it incorporates advocacy oh well thank you Camille um I'm so overwhelmed by what I have just heard, Mia and um, Melanie. I <laughs> I would be happy to just listen, but <laughs> but um, gosh, you know what I do doesn't come from doesn't seem to come from an intellectual place at all. It always seems to come from this very um, deep question that I have and I don't have the answers. I don't even try to give the answers. I just, I, I feel comfortable being, living in a state of questioning and, and asking the questions that maybe, is there an answer to? I don't know. I don't know. Um, as far as the song, this is not a protest song. You know, my brother whom I love dearly was homeless for several years and our family didn't know about it and prior to us finding out about it when i would pass homeless people on the street i would if i could see them like in a distance i would be making up my excuses way before i would pass them so that i wouldn't have to give them anything including not even acknowledge them by looking at them this is how i dealt with the pain of it it was a painful thing to see homeless people on the street and I just made up the story, well, they're just gonna spend their money on more alcohol or drugs and why should I contribute to it? I mean, I had it down pat till I was fine with walking past until I found out about my brother 
who is also alcoholic. But he was working a full-time job and living on the street because he would get drunk on payday and his friends would, his so-called friends would come around, drink up all of his money. He had nothing left. And when I found out my own brother was living on the street, I felt so ashamed. It finally hit me. It may seem obvious now, but at the time it wasn't obvious to me that all those people I've bypassed and ignored and judged were somebody's daughter or son or brother or father, mother. And so uh, I didn't want it to be a protest song because at the time, my viewpoint of jazz was that jazz is not the place for protest music anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's all about swing, it's all about bebop. Nobody sings about these topics anymore. So tongue in cheek, I, I decided to call, this is not a protest song, okay? So still listen to it. It's not jazz, as you can hear if you listen to it. It really comes from a country and Western folk vibe for me. So um, it's difficult to do these, to do these tunes about things that really cut me to the quick. But I figure if, if it's something that's impacting me and my family, then there's got to be at least one other person in the audience who's going through the same thing. And I want to write for that person. You know, I want to sing for that person and give that person something they can listen to and go, yeah, wow, that's the same thing happened to me, like you just said. Well, that's in my family. And I didn't have to look very far, Camille, to realize there's homelessness with my brother. The second verse in the song talks about my aunt. Um, and then the third verse really is talking about my mom when she left my dad because of, of uh, domestic abuse. We didn't have anywhere to live, but back in the day, we didn't call it homelessness. You know, we were sleeping on couches of relatives for three months. And I never realized, oh, we were homeless too, until I was working on the song, and it, it occurred to me. So um, that's where my creativity usually comes from, um, this very personal thing, almost as if I'm disconnected from what else is going on around me in the world. I'm totally focused on this internal yearning or internal need to express what the fuck just happened? Uh, how did I get to the, uh, this point? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. <laughs> That's it. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, Angelica. Um, you specialize in journalism and also in, in writing, and particularly focusing on music and social justice. Could you? Could you elaborate on your work with that and how you use it to connect with the community music and social activism? Yeah, sure. Uh, I just want to also uh, echo what every other woman has said here, uh, which is to thank you for this moment uh, in a time where I think we all <clears throat> could really use some serious healing. Um, and some grounding and connectedness. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I I think I was always a writer. Uh, I used to win like writing contests in elementary school and that kind of thing. And um, I come from a, uh, a very deep musical lineage on both my mother and father's side. And so very early on, uh, I understood the sort of inextricable tie between Black music and uh, our experience here. And so um, it wasn't something that I had to sort of figure out or put together because I would hear the music, but then I'd also hear the stories of, you know, 
uh, my own relatives who would you know lose a cabaret card for this or that and couldn't work and the struggles that my family went through as a result of that loss of it back in for context you used to have to have a cabaret card uh, to perform in live venues and that was the predominant uh, stream of income for musicians particularly jazz musicians and so um, hearing the stories from my family, you know, um, from my, you know, even my mom and, and close relatives who experienced sort of firsthand because my family lived quite communally, um, the impact of uh, racism, you know, the impact that racism had on artists and their ability to work and provide. And so these things were very um, apparent to me at a young age, I um, was always like a theater kid and artsy kid and all that kind of stuff. But around 19 years old, I realized that I wanted to get in on the business side of the music industry. And um, I started working for uh, ASCAP. And one day they pulled me in a room and said, we have this deep, dark, very racist history. And we want you to know about it. I started as an intern before I was hired. and. I remember going to my late aunt Nellie and asking for her, you know, what, what do I do? You know, should I work here or, you know, like, how do you feel of, you know? Um, so just very early on having this understanding that it wasn't like the entertainment industry for me, it was this reckoning of um, a deep, a deeply racial uh, context and uh, weaponizing against black artists. And so, when I, um, you know, I worked for labels and public radio and all that kind of stuff. And around the, t uh, I guess, uh, maybe, wow, 15 years ago, I realized that I wanted to write. I realized that I wanted to um, use my skill for writing to sort of elucidate these issues because it's not something that, um, that we look at from like this historical context of something that happened so long ago, you know, like I remember being in a board meeting when I was working for a label and um, it, it was a Monk Coltrane live at Carnegie album that had come out and the first week sales were really, really huge and they had surpassed uh, a pop artist that was on the label. And I remember a staff member saying, wow, who would have thought two dead guys would be this pop artist, Two Dead Guys, is how they referred to these giants. Um, and so I also realized that, you know, the, the, the record industry was not for me because I was go, you know, I, 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 could, I, I couldn't deal with that level of disrespect, but yet also, you know, this is how you profit. This is how you eat. This is how you take care of your family. Um, you're profiting off of the blood, sweat, tears of my ancestors, but they're reduced to two dead guys uh, in a meeting behind closed doors. Um, in, in, uh, it, um, it inspired me to write, you know, my experience of being a black woman um, working at jazz labels where they felt like, you know, why kind of like you don't really belong here or, you know, we're uncomfortable when we're at the the, uh, the water cooler, like geeking out about Wayne Shorter, but the fact that you can come and join us in, in this conversation and you're the only black person and you're a woman, it makes us uncomfortable, you know, those types of things. And so I didn't want to be in those spaces anymore. That's not how I felt that I could be most effective um, as a professional. And so I started, um, freelancing. I started writing um, because I also wanted to, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, creating space. Uh, I wanted to reclaim my space. I wanted to reclaim the space that I felt uh, I, sh I had justifiable uh, reasons to stand flat-footed and, and, and take up that space and offer narratives that frankly just weren't prevalent. You know, when we think about a lot of jazz writers, um, and, and so many of my heroes are, you know, Black jazz writers, but in this time, and, you know, I just felt like there weren't enough women, there weren't enough Black women. 
uh, there just weren't enough of us talking about, writing about, um, and writing from a perspective that, frankly, you know, white men and can't write from, you know, can't, they don't have, or, you know, even knowing what to ask, knowing, you know, what to say to musicians to, or musicians, even black musicians even feel comfortable enough to, to talk about certain things. So I wanted to use my platform and my voice to, um, to write from a perspective that was uh, black, that was uh, from a woman and that reminded people that this music is inextricably tied to our experience, our struggle, our joy, our oppression, um, our perseverance, all of it. Um, and so uh, that's, that's how I, it, it, it was, my writing was sort of birthed out of this need. It was birthed out of the deep seated racism that I experienced in the business. And then it was also birthed out of what I saw was just a void um, or just not enough voices. So that's how I, that's how I started. And that's, um, that's my purpose to this day, whatever uh, medium that I'm working in is to um, reclaim that space. Thank you. You said something really, really, really um, important that I feel drives home everybody's experience and what, how they connect their art to what they're seeing and experiencing. Being able to create that space or reclaiming that space. Um, for the ladies here, most of the ladies are musicians. And the last session we had, we talked about creating safe spaces to learn because many times they are the only woman in the band or maybe two or three women out of 15, 20 guys and creating a space that's safe to learn, comfortable to make mistakes, uh, and where you're able to express yourself, but learn about yourself and stand firm in being who you are. Can you share any thoughts that you have about that or how did you find that reclaiming and um, becoming, I guess, comfortable and firm in knowing who you are while creating that journey of finding and creating your space? Sure. Yeah. For me, it was never comfortable. And that's the thing I think we have to um, get used to is the being uncomfortable and doing it anyway. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I did because um, I experienced so much racism, so much sexism, and even sometimes ageism because, you know, there was this uh, unwillingness to sort of pass the torch you know, there, there can be, what happened? I'm so sorry. My... <laughs> okay, I have my moment. <laughs> okay. We can still hear you. <laughs> um, Nothing happened. <laughs> but, uh, well, you, it, 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 I don't know, sorry about that. Um, I was uh, just saying that um, there was never a moment where I felt comfortable. I remember when I was working in public radio and I wanted to do um, a program for Black History Month. It's Black History Month. I mean, I mean, I would think that whatever was, you know, Black, you know, but I said, uh, I wanted to do a series around, you know, uh, protest music. And um, to, to Renee's point, to sort of just remind everybody that this is social music. And um, a lot of the, my peers are, you know, writing music, you know, Ben Williams has an album out right now. Um, Sharni Wade did a Gil Scott Heron album. There's the, the people of my generation, so to speak, you know, we, we are uh, speaking and writing to the times. And so I wanted to do a, a, a series of how can we highlight this work from Max Roach to Sonny Rollins to, Brantford, 16th Street Baptist Church, or, you know, what Abby Lincoln, how can we, you know, and so I was told that it was too controversial mm. for our audience. And so um, I said, okay. So I went and took it to the news department. I said, you know, I kind of, I found a way around, you know, you, around it because I was like, well, this is a great project and I think this should happen. And if, if you don't want to do it during the the music hours, we had a news hour on the station. So I said, I went down to the, the uh, 
the people who ran the news department, I pitched it to them. They loved it. We produced it. Um, it was Randy Weston, uh, Robin D.G. Kelly, who was a brilliant biographer and researcher, uh, Marcus Strickland, and Terrence Blanchard. And it won an award. Wow. Uh, so it's, and, and, and I was not invited to the award oh, show. Oh, come on. What? Yep. What? Yep. That is crazy. Yeah, because wow. I was, you know, a new mom and they didn't think that I'd be, you know, we didn't think you'd be ready. So, you know, even um, with Nia spoke too about, you know, motherhood and how that is stigmatized in the workplace. It's like, this is an award ceremony. I'm nominated for award. The award has my name on it and it's placked up on your institution, but you didn't think to invite me to the ceremony, you know? Mm -hmm. So there, I don't think there's ever a time when you're comfortable um, I think that it's been deeply uh, um, harmful in many ways. Um, I think the way that Audre Lorde talks about self-care being revolutionary and our existence being revolutionary and us just being here and holding space with each other, being revolutionary, um, existing, as we see with, with what's happening in the world with, with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Nina Pop and... Um, everybody so so i think it's just doing it uh and having the support that you need more than anything because it's hard work it's work that you, you will be in harm's way but i think doing it anyway um and us doing the work to let people know that they have our support is probably the most paramount of all was me having those people that i could go to and cry you know, those people who said, we're going to go into that institution, and rip that award off the wall if need be. You know, you just, you need, you need your support and your friends and allies and all of that. Nia, and this can go for you, Renee and Melanie. When you were going through your journey of um, figuring out how to use your artistry and accessing and creating that space of what you wish to, to um, research and learn more about did you have any inspiration did you uh have any resources that you went to was, were there any books that you read to help you with understanding or getting your mind to prepare and and, and figuring out how you're going to embark the journey of discovery and speaking out <laughs> uh yeah well uh, tons of books i mean in lots of ways um and I'd also like to, to say that we make a, a book list here. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I would say, as I had said before, probably my first really deep connection was really Fred Moulton I, uh, in the break. Um, and after reading Fred, and, and, and let me just say to, uh, to the younger people here, um, you know, um, the way that I acquire knowledge, which I was not clear about as a youth, um, because everything was really about the written word and about um, that, that way to knowledge and intellectualism. Um, and as a, as a very young child, um, I was really very timid and um, withdrawn in some ways. Um, so I read, but I wasn't really a writer. Like I didn't write about the thing, right? Um, and I started moving as a young child. I started expressing myself um, as a younger person. Um, and that appeared to be an intellect that I had not been taught, had been told about um, in any of the educational systems, still isn't, right? I mean, art is the first thing to leave, uh, notions of, you know, standardized education. Um, and, 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 and who gives a damn about um, what you think? Just memorize this shit, write it down, post it, and there you go, right? So I think that, um, so I said all that just to say to you that when I was reading Fred shit, I also went online and looked up Fred on YouTube. 
because I wanted to hear his voice. I needed to inoculate my spirit with the tonality of his, of his thinking. Like his thinking on paper was really beautiful, right? Um, but there's something about the poetics that he, he's a poet, an amazing poet that I needed to hear the cadence in his voice. You know, and I grew up with jazz musicians, right? So, um, and jazz connoisseurs. So I, I, I was, so it was about the tone, it's about the cadence, it's about like the weight of a yep, dissonant that's, that's chord, enough. you know? So I think that I went on and I just one kept one looking one at um, um, the yeah, YouTube with, yeah. with, with Fred. And then I started just like pushing into Horton no. Spiller, another amazing scholar um, and practitioner. Um, also, somebody has their mic on, so I don't know. Victoria, can you turn your mic off? Oh, okay. I'm so sorry, not my mic off, please. Okay. Or you can mute him, Camille. Camille. Yeah, you can. There you go, the hierarchy of, of mute. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so Fred Moulton, Horton, Horton Spillers, um, Saidea uh, Hartman, uh, Audrey Lord. Oh my gosh, she's my, uh, like, uh, like I, I'm pissed that I didn't know Audrey when I was like 16. You know, I didn't really hear about Audrey until my late 20s, right? So I, I didn't, I, there was so much like unsaid about the nature of and the power and the nurture of feminine, feminine power, domesticity inside of this patriarchal system that had been completely suppressive over generations, even of thought, speech, and action, right? So um, yeah, so I know I'm, I'm kind of going on. So I, I will also put other... Um, when I, when I don't want to take a lot of time and sometimes, you know, after 55, sometimes my memory get a little, you know, I had to write that shit down. So I don't want to take it too much time, y'all. But I will put um, some, you know, when we get together, Camille, I put some other, because I think I did that for you too. Mm -hmm. I just put some books that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing into, but not just books, yo. I mean, really about visual, like painters. Painters are so important to me. My father is a sculptor. And you, hear, you heard me, Maxine, I said, is, right? So he is still <laughs> on the planet, right? In some way, right? He, he is the rememory of... <laughs> so, I mean, you know, sculpture, painting, viscerality are all my, all my inspirations. Yeah, sorry, it took so much. Yeah. And, and Melanie, you're a visual artist. You combine your artistry of singing, but also with creating mixed media art. For sure, for sure. I'm going to just definitely piggyback on all of you wonderful women who just said some amazing things. I've just been scribbling things down. Looks, looks a bit like hieroglyphics from this meeting. You got books, ladies? <laughs> <laughs> hieroglyphics, for, for sure. Um, uh, for, for me, you know, I, I feel like if you're an artist in one form, all you have to do is just open up your mind to other genres or other mediums and this is really what happened to me when I when I moved to New York about almost four years ago um, you know we had a, a roommate things were very tense and I thought how can I find some peace in this very busy bustling city and I started just looking at YouTube oh my gosh mixed media collage let's see if we can do this I'm not really much of a drawer or a painter but um, this enabled me to just express myself in a different way, in a very kind of quiet wonder way. And then from there I went on and I, you know, kind of did more research and I, I was at Lincoln Center one day in the Armstrong room, I think it is, and I saw this beautiful beard and collage of Duke Ellington. And I was like, wow, this is something else. And and I just threw myself completely into it, but went from being a hobby to things that you you see you know, kind of in the background here, and I've just, <laughs> there we go, I've just filled the room with, with so much stuff. Um, but I will say that, you know, um, like Nia was saying, go and search for things that you know are gonna inspire, enlighten, um, awaken something in your spirit. Um, you know, and I love also um, what Angelica was saying about reclaiming your own space, you know, because I think a, a lot of the times as women, 
we're told to know our place, you know, and especially in African culture, we're told to know our place and to remember that we are all loved, you know, that the stars are keeping a place for us, that our ancestors are keeping a place for us. When we walk into a space, we have a lineage of people walking with us. And, and I think there's so much power in that. And I think that's really driven home for us as Africans, um, you know, that we do have this lineage we can draw on. Um, some books that really spoke to me um, was actually um, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know if any of you guys have read this, but I loved the whole idea of trusting the gut feeling and the gut instinct in, in knowing that when we trust that, we are able to, to discern uh, what's real and what's not. And I think often we are not taught to trust our gut, you know, because, oh, you got to wait for someone to prove that it's, you know, not the, you know, not the real Mona Lisa. You can't just be, you know, saying it's not the real Mona Lisa, but we feel that, you know, we feel it when we meet someone, we feel it when we are eating something from the fridge that's not quite, you know, on, <laughs> we feel it. And yet we're taught to ignore that instinct. And that instinct is, is present in everything. And especially for us as artists, it's present. You know, you, you know, Camille, when you pick up your horn, okay, that's the chord, but this is what my gut's saying I should play there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my late grandmother was such a strong advocate of the gut feeling, you know, she was always like that gut feeling is the Holy Spirit leading you, guiding you every single day. And the times that I've not listened to that gut instinct is when I've put myself in mortal danger. So that's a book that really, really spoke to me, uh, especially when I was traveling and I, I left South Africa five years ago and lived in Eastern Europe for two years. And then you, I really had to trust my gut instinct because I didn't speak the language. And I was experiencing living in Eastern Europe as a, as a woman of color, which, you know, most days in normal societies is crazy, but in a place where you don't speak the language and it is still very patriarchal, you know? So that spoke to me. I love Sylvia Plath. Uh, she's one of my favorite female poets, actually, and many people don't really know her her stuff so much um you know she of course unfortunately committed suicide so she had a very short career but a lot of her stuff really really speaks to me really spoke to me in the way that she was able to see things in a very quirky and and whimsical kind of way and not writing kind of just like straight down the middle um i think i mentioned bearden i you know, because I live in the East Village, I went on this kind of down the rabbit hole of Basquiat and Andy Warhol. And yes. I, was like, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I was like, this is incredible. So that really just informed me, you know, from a musician perspective, I've always loved John Coltrane. Like he's, for me, one of the spiritual gurus um, of our time. And, you know, just touching on what Angelica was saying, to say that these two dead guys are making more money. I mean, the level of disrespect right there just shows that these people have no idea who they're talking about, you know? Um, John Coltrane was, I would say that he's a comet, you know? He just blazes through and, and kind of just, you know, gives us that spirituality from the first note till the last breath. And he's just forever for me, like, just very sacred jazz music. Um, and then from a female perspective, you know, musicians that have gotten me through some really tough times in my life. Um, and I found these women just to be so incredibly brave and outspoken. And Angelica, like you were saying, you know, this, um, this idea of being uncomfortable, but you know, that, that uncomfortability, nothing is really born in the comfort zone you know, and it's so, so necessary. And so, you know, Abby Lincoln, Nina Simone, you know, Nina for me, you know, consummate, consummate classical pianist could be on any stage in the world and be hailed as one of the best classical pianists to have ever lived. And then you add on top of that, you know, her heritage as a, a blues and jazz singer, and then an activist, you know, and what really like I love about her and especially the third woman I'd like to mention is 
Miriam Makeba, of course, at the height of all of their fame, they chose activism. They did not choose awards. They chose activism. And so for me, that just always makes me feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of some serious giants every single day, you know? And the last book I want to mention is one I'm reading right now called Women Who Run With The Wolves. I don't know if any of you've read this. This is an amazing book. It's been recommended to me by different, um, you know, female friends of mine. But recently in quarantine, and I was quarantined in Germany for about two months because I got stuck there. So I only came home past Monday and I'd been out of New York for three whole months. So this book really spoke to me and um, I'm sure it's gonna speak to you guys. It really speaks on what Nia Love was saying, you know, the divinity, the feminine power of women and how we are taught within a society these days to suppress that, you know, um, when we actually should be celebrating it and we should be embracing it in ourselves and in others, in other women, because if we stand together, and I say it again, you know, there's nothing we can't do if we don't stand together. Yeah. You, you said something that really struck me because um, I remember when I first started working with the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra, it was like a big kind of thing because it was the first time they ever had a woman work full time with them. And I remember mentally the yes. back forth that I, I went through personally and like, okay, I understand this is something new, but it's not new. Yes. At the same time, feeling that uncomfortability of it's, it's new territory. And for me, what helped me mentally forget about the, the mental chatter and the, the, whether it was actual mental chatter or my, my, my actual own internal mental chatter, what helped me to, to center myself was every time, whenever I would play, and it didn't matter any situation, whether it was there or even with my own band or in any situation, I was always thinking about the people before me, particularly the women that took that same seat. The women who had to fight mm -hmm. to be respected to for, for playing, the, the women who didn't get the, um, the attention to be able to have an opportunity to play and they were just as good, or even the women that you didn't see or read about in the history books or in the movies. And that's what gave me my strength to be able to mentally sit down and just play. Because sometimes when we're going through things that make us uncomfortable and we, we look around and we don't see anybody else that looks like us, or we feel like there's things that we can't, might not have the language to be able to express with others, that's the one thing that can kind of give you that courage and that inspiration to be able to, to put that feet on the floor flat and just go straight forward. So just, I just wanted to throw that out there because you said something. Renee, I know you got something to add to it too. <laughs> you know, I, I'm so inspired by everybody's comments and um, gosh, the, the main thing I want to say is I think from the time we're born, as females and as women of color especially, there's an agenda everybody else has for you. Um, your family, of course, they have, they have dreams and wishes and hopes for you, an agenda for, you, for your behavior, the things you will be interested in, what you will look like, how you'll dress, <laughs> on and on and on. And so to, to everybody, um, who's, who's just listening and hasn't had a chance to talk yet. I just want to encourage you um, to, to see the importance of what Melanie said about our intuition. I, maybe you weren't, it wasn't just you, Melanie, maybe it was somebody else too, but our intuition is and our instinct um, is like this note that we're born with already inside us. And as we go through life, there is each thing we do and people we meet is like a tuning fork, you know? They have their own note. And the farther we get away from the note that resonates within us, we might be attracted to this 
want to go here because somebody else is doing it or sing this or play that. The farther we get away from our internal note, the more dissonance there is. And we know it. Mm -hmm. We also know it when we are right, when we are just uh, vibrating right in harmony with our note and what we're doing too. All of it is working together. We know it. That is the thing. That is the thing that helps us know where to take the next step. And sometimes if we just say out loud what we think we might want to do, just the way it feels to our ears and how it makes us feel when we, when we say that thing will determine or let us know whether that is the course to take or some other course. So when, we're, when, when I'm trying to make a decision, I will often say, okay, I'm going to take this gig and do such and such and such. How does that feel? And then I'll, I'll say the opposite. Okay, I'm not going to take this gig and such and such and such. How does that feel? That feels better. Because the body always knows. We already know. We just have to trust what we, what we already know. I believe that so sincerely. And it's just like you said, Melanie, the more we do it, the stronger it gets. So yeah. I just want to encourage every, everybody. We, we always have these, these questions, inner questions about what should we do? What if so-and-so doesn't like it? Or what, what are they going to say about me if I don't, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on. I'm laughing. I always because, trust that. I'm laughing because <laughs> I really love that you said that. And it's something about that gut that Melanie talked mm -hmm. about. It also doesn't just like garner itself under um, ways to practice our craft, but ways to live our life, ways of diet, ways of health. Um, and the gut is, is, is right. like you said, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I wrote that down and I'm, I'm going to quote you on that shit. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> the, yeah, the, yeah. the, the Holy gut. Yeah. The gut. Holy gut. My, my granny would be very happy if you were quoting her in that. Oh, oh, oh I got to quote you. What, okay. I'll get her name out. Her name was Sarah. Yeah. Sarah Dugan. Yes. S A R A H. Yes. D U G A N. O U G A N. O U G A N. Yes. Okay, yeah. But I, I just wanted to comment on that. Like that those are ways to practice, y'all. I think that it's not and 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 also Angelica talking about the uncomfortability of resistance, um, the ways in which we push into our craft is, you know, and even as a younger artist, I remember in my twenties, you know, I was um I just got back from Cuba. I lived in Cuba for some time and I wanted to really uh be a ballerina. And it wasn't until I went to Cuba that I was able to kind of realize my black body as a ballerina um, and coming back to the United States feeling really um, uh, erased, uh, f but also forced me to do some other shit, you know, because it was so painful um, that I couldn't even express myself through this body under that, under that quote unquote tool. You know, but I just pushed forward, you know, on it. And it's because I was like, well, I'm, this is some shit like, you were saying about coming through, um, I think it was you, Renee, coming, coming with this note inside of you, you know, this real serious, like, hum, you know, John Coltrane's sensibility of that, you know, mm, like, I, it, it's just, yeah, I just commenting. I'd love to hear from other people. Yeah, Angelica, Angelica yeah, I'm sorry, Angelica, you had something to say real quick? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, also, uh, a, a, a thought from, you know, extending on what Melanie was talking about, about t uh, intuition. And I think also in this country, um, there's a very calculated agenda to make us question our intuition. It's very anti-Black, it's very anti-woman, um, the way that this country gaslights you uh, when you speak truth to power, when you just say it, make it plain like Malcolm X said, um, and I think that part of what our work is doing with every creative on this panel and everyone who, listening who's a creative, um, the, the takeaways that we can take from our ancestors who did all of this work before us is that they left us with so much to stand on when we're approached with this 
very, you know, I had a woman who, um, I, you know, I'd made a point and uh, on social media and uh, this white woman said, you know, well, if you know so much, you know, well then, well then what's the answer, you know, kind of thing. It was like, you know, if you, if you're, if you're this uh, uppity smart Negro, you know, well then, with it, well then what do we do kind of thing, you know, and it, it, it was, you know, it was, it was awful. It, and it is, it is awful and miserable every time we try to, you know, express what's happening, what's actually happening. And we, and to have that questioned, to have, you know, what we see and what we hear and what we know and what we experience as people questioned, um, it's, you know, it's gaslighting at its, at its, um, at its highest form. And so I think leaning, also leaning on these literary works, these, these visual and mixed media and, and our, our, our activists who, you know, died doing the work, you know, um, everybody, every, every ancestor who was meant, who has been mentioned so far here is I think part of what, and what our work will do is be a reference point and be that support, you know, to help people, not that we need a valid validation to feel, to, to, to take, to take the stand or to say what we need, what needs to be said. But when we have that army walking behind us, I forgot who, who said that, I think it was Nia. We have this legion of ancestors, you know, this, this, mm -hmm. this, you know, I think it's so, that's important too. So that's the kind of work that I want to leave behind. I aspire to leave work behind that will help give somebody support in their fight. Yes. Ladies, thank you so much for this. I'm just beaming. I hope the other ladies out there are enjoying this. Real quick, I know we're over time. Does any of the ladies in the Zoom room have questions? And if there's anybody out on Facebook, just shoot a question down in the comment box. I'm gonna try my best to get it in real quick. Now's the time. <laughs> <laughs> just please say your name and then ask a question because I can't see you. And okay, you're unmuted. Anybody has a question? Okay, I'll ask a question. Okay. Hey, Whitney. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm a writer, singer, um, a dancer. And there's one thing that I'll, and thank you very much, Camille, for having us today. I think it's very inspirational and very much needed. I have a question for all you ladies. We are at a time in history that we are all trying to come together. If all of you had to write a song with just three words in it, what would it be and what would it be about? At this time and age, like today, today, what song would you write? Or maybe it's, if it just had one word, if that's easier, what would it be? And what, what would the song title be? And what would it be about? Change right now. I like that one. Anybody else? Come on, Renee. She had some connection with uh, issues, so she'll, she'll probably going to be watching from Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Come on, Angelica. Freedom right now. <laughs> I have one. Okay. Uh -huh. let's, let's empower, inspire, and encourage one another. Fire and courage. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that one. I'm sorry. Inspire, encourage one another. I like that. Do we have any other questions out there, ladies? They could be about anything, even if it's music. It's cool. I mean, all this stuff is applicable to life, but you got a specific question. So I can ask my initial question or not? Just wait? Uh, just wait one second. Okay, there was a question that I did receive from an anonymous person. How is the best, and what is the best way of 
uh, learning how to improvise as a beginner? Hmm. Okay. Well, the first thing is to get inspiration. You, you need to find somebody that you love and admire and that you love to listen. If they give you some type of feeling that you can connect with, listen to them as much as you can. My person was Dexter Gordon. Even though I didn't understand how to play what he was playing, I listened to it over and over and over and over again until I was able to literally absorb it. And then I would sing it and then I would play it. And it didn't matter if it took a week or two months to bit by bit understand what he was doing and apply it to my instrument. He just kept doing it. So I would totally suggest find somebody that you love and you could even just start out with the blues. For me, I love train slow blues because it's very simple and he's playing off of a little phrase that builds and builds and tells a beautiful story over five, six, seven choruses. Just start right there. Whatever inspires you, try, try to figure it out. And as you're figuring it out, you'll get stronger and empower yourself and get better at it. That's my best answer. Okay, and then I would say I want to yeah. add to that. Sure. Um, uh, inspiration also comes from the things around you, not just the people, right? Okay. So, uh, okay. like geography and site spaces to put yourself in a meditational space within a place that resonates with you, and really take some time there. Um, look at things that you've never really narrowed in and looked at maybe ants maybe snakes yeah. Yeah. maybe dogs maybe whatever so i think those inspirations are really deep and and our si brothers and sisters that don't have legs and arms are very intuitive and gut knowledgeable and they resonate deep because they don't s talk with the thing that we talk with so if we just stay leaning in and listen, you know, that's a, that's a huge inspiration. Can I say something sure. Nia touch on? Um, I think I hear what Nia was saying also. Um, be around people that inspire you. A lot of us, I work in a department with people with mental disability and I get to see, we have, they say we have five senses, right? It says, what is it? But these people don't have, the, don't have the ability that some of us, what I'm trying to say is we have more ability that um, is not being used, utilized. That is what I want to say. I'm, I, I like what Nia said. Mm -hmm. Nia love. I like that. And because I get to, ex, ex, I'm exposed to that, I try to put myself in that space to use that other senses that we don't use. Did that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to just jump in and, and as, uh, piggyback on yours as well as, as Nia's and say that, you know, the other day I was listening to Stevie Wonder and I, I just thought he sees everything very clearly, even though he is blind. And the other, other senses are heightened because one is missing. So, you know, when I'm going to go back to what people are asking about, you know, how to improvise. I think listening is a massive part of that. You know, even when you're on the bandstand with other people, don't just be waiting to jump in with your part of the conversation because a conversation is a two way street. That's right. You have to listen. And so when you listen, you actually close your eyes somehow by closing your eyes, your ear is just so much more attuned to what, you're listening to even if it's just sitting and listening to the birds in the trees they sound so much clearer just by that simple act of closing the eyes and opening the ear you know so um i thought those points were really amazing that you guys made i'm gonna jump in there one more time y'all sure. <laughs> <laughs> i think another really powerful um tool of improvisation is not being afraid of abstraction like what it is to be abstract about the way that you engage in a thing and how it plays inside of yourself 
whether it's in your instrument or in your body or in your pen or, and not always like finding yourself editing yourself, mm -hmm. right? Like editing, editing, editing. So you always get to this notion of the blue clerk um, that uh, Dion Brand talks about a lot. Like before you can even just talk about all the things that, it, that, that you are, you know, you start editing yourself and that's the thing. The edit version is the thing that everybody ends up seeing. But then the archival, archival narrative gets dissed in a way, it gets silenced, like this deeper, uh, deeper sensibility of what improvisation is coming from this body of yours, you know, not being afraid of abstraction. Yeah. And exactly. Most people think too much. You yeah. know, when they improvise, they think too much. Well, that's the thing, too. You're judging yourself before you even can act or speak. And I think that's why it's, it's important, whether it's in a classroom or even if it's just you by yourself and you're learning, you have to develop a space where you are not closing yourself into judgment. This is an art form that is about expression, whether mm -hmm. it's jazz, whether it's dancing, whether it's singing, it's expression. So if that's how your, your natural reaction or uh, your, your inhibition to be proactive or reactive, reactive, that's life. Let yeah. it be. Don't try to stifle it because then you're not learning. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah, want to if you box it in. Oh, I was just going to say, if you box it in like that, then you're limiting yourself for expression. Exactly. Mm -hmm. For sure. You're going to say something real quick, Eustra? I wanted to say something quick. Um, I think as the lady from South Africa, no? mm -hmm. yeah. she says something that touched me about allowing that dialogue to take place. You know, because you, I think you said, oh, don't wait to jump in for your side of inter improvisation. You know, and I think it's disrespect anyway. You know, I will give you that platform because I like, when I listen to jazz, I like when the moment, when the dialogue start happening. You know, that's the, that's the art. It's beautiful, it's fascinating. It's, in, it's, in, it's inspired me. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, it's, it's like, yes, it's two instruments, but it's, there is a conversation going on. Mm -hmm. There is a dialogue. That's the part of music that fascinates me the most. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, having a conversation is, what do you have to say? Okay. <laughs> Okay, did you say that? Da, da, da. You know, I like that, you know? And also, I want to say something from my heart to Camille. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so, so, so much to create this platform. Because I grew up in the Caribbean as a musician. I was being discriminated as a female musician. There is time with my instrument in my hand. The, the manager have to come and get me. I have my instrument in my hand. An ID is not enough. They will not let me go in in the venue where I was performed. So I can relate to last time, I forgot the day, last time, the first one on the 21st. Thank you so much to create this platform. You don't know how much I am. I don't have enough worth of gratitude. It's about time for we women come together to empower, encourage and inspire one another and stop fighting for each other. Start fighting. Let's empower each other, each of us in our own ways. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that from my heart. Thank you so much, Justra. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. And please give a big round of applause for our guests, Angelica Beener, Mia Love, Melanie Schultz, Renee Marie. Thank you for your wisdom, for your words of uh, advice and encouragement. If you'd love to learn more about these ladies, I'm gonna put a Google Sheet up where you can access their websites and uh, links to their work as well. And also, please be sure to um, check out the comments and because we're streaming on Facebook, uh, check out the comments because I'm also gonna post some links for some places where if you can, you can donate to some organizations that are doing some wonderful work right now on the ground as we speak with, with what's happening in the world. So if you can try to donate towards these causes and also look out for the next Haven Hang at www.
dot camillefermanmusic dot com slash the Haven Hang. Oh, I have one more question that came in. Is it okay if we take this real quick, ladies? I'm sorry. Sure. Sure, yeah, we're enjoying it. Oh. I mean, it ain't like we got it. We it ain't like we can go outside and go somewhere, Camille. <laughs> This question well, is straight from Facebook. Her name is Sue. Do you have any advice on how to approach men in professional situations when they're organizing playing, teaching events, gigs, conferences, etc.? cetera? Mm. So wait, read that again. Do you have any advice on how to approach men in professional situations when they're organizing situations of playing, teaching, or even gig events or conferences and booking each other? And there's only- That's a shame it has to be a difference. She's, she said 2020, but I don't want to call them out, but there should be more than just one woman, one token woman. Okay. Yeah. Um, we talked about this the last Haven hang, hang a little bit. This is a hard question. To one degree, this, when we're talking about the music business, particularly jazz, there's a lot of men in it. And there's not a lot of, there, there are women in the scene, but there's not as many as the men. And we could go on for hours on that conversation because that has to deal with access to education, support platforms to be able to give women opportunities to learn and also the support to continue that learning all the way up through elementary school, high school and college to get to a place where they're empowered and built strong enough to be able to hold their own. That's a whole nother conversation. But when it comes to representation and being hired, it's tricky because on one end, when we're hired, most of us think we're hired because of our ability, which it should be that. If you invested the time, you perfected your craft, and you're playing at a level where you're able to execute your instrument and make it speak at a high level, Yes, you should be hired. Unfortunately, there are situations where even if you have all those checks marked, it still doesn't allow you to get included in the situation. For some women, they've gone to create their own ensembles. And this kind of goes back to what we talked about, creating your own space, where you're creating a space where you can access being able to play music and play with the people that you want to play with and still progress and move on artistically and developing yourself. And then in some situations, that's when it comes down to having your allies and your mentors. Um, when if it's a situation where you feel like you're repeatedly not getting uh, selected, even and you're on the same level as everybody else, eyes dyed, T's crossed, cross, playing amazing, but you're still not getting selected because you're a woman, that's when it's time to bring in your men and women to support you and say, hey, listen, if everybody's hired and you have auditions and, and we're not seeing a diverse um, situation here and if you're publicly funded too, we have to make a change because if this is supposed to represent our community and it's not, we need to have a discussion. And then also creating opportunities where people, men and women can play and apply and, and be able to show that they can play. Hey, sounds really simple, but that's what I think. And they can't give up so easily. You can't. You can't yeah. give up. You, you have, it's, I'm, I'm going to be real honest with you. You're going to feel really lonely a lot of times. You might have to say no to your girlfriends and put that five, six extra hours to perfect your craft. And you might also have to um, put yourself in situations where you're getting your butt kicked musically so that you can strengthen yourself to be and get able back to up into those situations where you used to get, yeah, like Whitney said, you're used to being able to get back up so that you could show up and do the gig. And if they hire you, great. If they don't hire you, we got a find space where that you, you make your space to, to, to perform or be less organized and make it so that we all can play here, men and women. Yeah, I think in the dance world, um, you know, men to a certain degree, white men and white women have been um, kind of like the quote unquote forerunners 
of a lot of gigs, um, both in the institutionalized education, up, up, you know, in, in collegiate world, as well as in postmodern scenes of dance. Um, and it, it, it required a certain kind of um, dismantling, right, of the way and the way in which we think um, as women, particularly as black women and women of color, uh, but women in general, but women of color specifically, um, how we uh, unite, make space, uh, and create platforms that we can then ask for, uh, um, and I mean ask meaning apply for different fundings that support our vision, right, and make a space for us to do this first. And I, and I also think that this is a, like you said, Camille, this is not an easy fix kind of thing, you know, and this, this platform is one of those places. I also feel like, and I, I would just kind of, you know, as one of the, maybe the elders on, on this uh, Zoom, it, it, I would say too that, you know, it's great to have us here, you know, the, the people that have been invested in our craft for a long period of time, but I'm really, you know, and I teach all over, um, and I, I really want to hear the voices of you young people. Like you have to step up and you got to have your voice, even if the shit is not as quote unquote articulate as you think it is. Cause I walk away from shit always like, damn, was I articulate or was I like going around the, the room? And cause I talk in circles. I mean, that's blackness. We talk in a lot and talk in ways in which that information, you know, kind of, kind of uh, supports itself. It's, it's not a, it's not a like horizontal kind of like plane. So I want to, you know, I would say in your next um, thing, uh, platform, to answer this question for this person, or uh, for all of us, right, is that this is really a platform for, for us, and us is us. Us is like, you know, like we and me is together. So if I'm, I'm speaking and you want you, you're, you want to say something, you know, you, you just got to push in into that space so that we understand the platform so that, you know, those hard questions can be like, at least we can bring them to the table and be like, yo, but I don't know, like, well, maybe we should do that, you know, and that's where all of the creative energy and all the things that we were talking about in the very beginning about each one of our works kind of ends up happening is because we've always been under the notion of, of really white settlership, patriarchy. We've been under this, this really oppressive space that built the ways in which we think. So right now, what Camille is doing is creating a space for this to happen, for us to not necessarily be fucking articulate. We just want to ask the question, who said that is not about, I think it was you, uh, Angelica, about I don't know. I don't know if I want the answer. I just want to be able to develop the question. If I can bring the question to the table, even if it's you know a little discombobulated, so be it. And I want to hear more from the younger people. Um, I would introduce them, folks. I would prompt them first, so that they can start to speak. You know, in a way, because sometimes when you don't, you know, I got children and grandchildren. So if you don't prompt them, they're gonna be just listening and shit like this. You know, and then they'll be like, well, what y'all think? Mm, well, you know, you said so many things. I don't know what to think, right? So um, I don't know how to move forward other than the prompting people to get their voices out. And it's a practice, right? It's a practice just like me dancing or you writing or us building and painting. It's a practice. You just got to get the pen to the paper and make the mark. That's where it starts. They have to have confidence in their, in their own intelligence. Look what the uh, young children have done as far as protesting right now That's and brought right. to light. You know, I, I think a lot of, uh, even, it doesn't matter what age you are, we as women, as, as women, we have to believe in our intelligence, that we are very intelligent and, and have that confidence. And we also have to come together as, as a support system for each other so that even when one exactly. person, or if she can't, articulate it or have the words or develop the language to be able to push it forward. We're able to help each other in, in getting it out. Um, ladies, I have at my website 
a link where if you can't, if you don't want to ask the question publicly, you can submit questions anonymously or you can submit questions beforehand so that your question can still be heard because this is for you. This is the place and space for you where it's safe to ask and learn. So use it, utilize it. It's judgment free, it's safe, and you have resources here. You have artists that have been through it, done it, still doing it, that you can model after, you can contact, well, I don't wanna put your stuff out there, but if you got questions, you can contact me, any of the artists here, I'm sure they'd be happy if you wanna email them. We're here. So just ask, We just reach out and do it. And I want to make sure we all we, learn from each other. Yeah, I was gonna say we. I want to make sure I got Angelica stuff, Melanie stuff. You know, I haven't heard from Christine yet, but Whitney and all. You know, wow, it just is so. I learn from all generations. I learn from all generations, and like Camille said, coming together, this is such a great platform that she's uh, developed. Thank you, Camille. Yeah, we have to practice opening up that throat chakra. So even if we're not comfortable saying something out loud here, uh, say it out loud in your private space and then say it out loud in the mirror. And then, you know, gradually get yourself to a place, you know, open up that throat, do, do things that move the air. Because I think for a lot of us, you know, our voices being uh, taken away from us historically and how it's still, I think it definitely affects the throat chakra. So opening that up, you know, whether it's singing, yelling, whatever it is, and getting to a place where we can feel comfortable, not that you have to be a public speaker, but hear the sound of your voice bellowing in your chest, asking what you want to know or expressing yourself. It's important. It's important not to lock up in here, especially for black people and people of color. That's right. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh, wait, one other thing. Whitney, sure. Whitney, look in the in the thing, in the yeah. side thing. That was for you, really, but I couldn't access you. You asked us about what it would be during this time. What would it look like? Uh, what is the word? <laughs> oh, yeah, of the, yeah, yeah. That's my that's my thing right there. Walking against the horizontal. Thank you. I was getting inspiration because I also do birth and mixed media. And I wanted to just feel hear these a creative consciousness at this particular time because I'm working on a project and I want to thank you. Once again, thank you so much, everybody. Give it up for Angelica Beener, Nia Love, Melanie Schultz. We're going to go TV, girl. You can put this on TV. <laughs> I'm going to post this on Facebook so in case for those who are sleeping right now on the other side of the world, they can check it out. The next Haven Hang is going to be June 17th. Please RSVP, go to the website, www.camillethermymusic.com slash RSVP and fill out the questionnaire form. If you want to ask a question beforehand, fill it out. And if you want to join us on Zoom so you can have an interaction with us, let me know. Thank you again. Thank you to our guests, ladies. I hope you have a wonderful and safe night. I hope this was inspiring and fed your soul. If you got some more questions, Email me for the next one. I'll see you soon. Mwah. <laughs> <laughs>